Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to The Take Up. This is episode 10, Homework, Upgrading Your Habits and Gear. Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Eric Campbell. If you don't know, I am here to discuss all things embroidery and decoration with you. And today we have on episode 10, a discussion of what I first called homework. And this is really about more than just working at home, though certainly working at home will be part of it. We're going to talk about leveling up in a home-based business, maybe from hobby to a commercial business or a cottage business. We'll talk about that a little bit, talk about machines and things out that you might need to know when you are leveling up. We'll talk about uh, working at home, some practices for that that'll help you stay sane, especially now in what we have going on. And we're gonna discuss any of the Q&A you can bring up. So please get in the comments. I'll be bouncing back and forth between the comments and uh, some points that I want to make and a couple articles and just some cool things that are happening in the industry right now uh, and that are happening around some of our uh, initiatives that are helping to deal with the current crisis. Once again, I don't like to say crisis, but we all know we're going through some things and I would like to make sure that we are doing it in our best way. Before, before we start though, I would really love to check in with some of the people who have already jumped on in and said hi. So uh, this is Curtis. Uh, hello, Curtis. Really like the Saturday class. Now to figure out how to get my software to do all that neat stuff. Uh, he is referring to referring to the uh, demystifying next level digitizing webinar that I recently did. And we actually have some news about that toward the end. Uh, thank you, Curtis, for showing up. And for everybody else who did show up for that class, that was a great class, great group of people and uh, wonderful questions. But we have some options for that uh, due to popular demand for the folks who didn't get to go in that we'll discuss at the end. Also, we have Jeff Fuller. Jeff Fuller says he is ready. I know you're ready. You are always ready to talk embroidery, and I'm glad to have you here. Christine, partner in crime for many things, including the Ask the Expert section of uh, wearables that we used to write. Christine, happy to see you here too. Justin, happy Friday. Uh, yeah, I don't know if the days of the week mean much anymore. I mean, not that they ever did for a lot of us. I know digitizers like myself and probably like Justin, we kind of work seven days a week uh, at any given time anyway. So I uh, definitely want to say, yeah, happy Friday to those of you who have a Friday. And if you uh, don't have a Friday, you know, hey, I'll say this. Those of us who are able to work through this are very lucky. And those of the, us who have not had a chance to work right now, you know, I feel for you guys. It's hard not to get this work in and uh, it's hard to be without your space. So uh, hopefully talking about working at home may help you a little bit. But happy Friday, Justin. Uh, Cindy also attended the class. Very awesome. Cindy, good afternoon. Glad to see you here. Daryl, force for positivity in the industry. Always saying awesome stuff. Sup, Daryl. Mike is here. Aloha, Mike. Good to see you here, too. Always has good questions. Christine, heard the class went really well. Yeah, it did. And I would say not because I think I did anything all that uh, different than what I usually do. I hope I gave everybody some good value and information. But we had great people in the class who really enjoyed it. And uh, from what I've heard, some of that talk going around has made people want to take more online classes. It, what it makes me happy about is that uh, doing this online education that's now become kind of de rigueur, it's kind of what we have to do now. Uh, that there's more opportunities for that to work and that uh, the formats that I've been doing live are going to work as a webinar are still going to be valuable for everybody. So I'm hoping that uh, both I can do some more education and I know I've been talking to you, Brian and Brilliance, that we always have done a lot of education, uh, but we're going to be doing more of that. And I know that Brilliance is going to be a part of that and that's awesome too. So being able to do that on my own was a great test case for some of the stuff I want to do for our kind of software community. As you may know, I work uh, with Imbrilliance and I am at the Imbrilliance offices again here too. So I, <laughs> I'm lucky once again, big giant office, nobody else is in it. Uh, I can keep it clean, keep it sanitary. And I literally go from my house to my sanitized car to my office and back. So luckily I'm still in the, uh, in the offices doing what we can do. So that's really awesome. Uh, Bill, thank you for showing up, Bill. Uh, glad that you're going to get to do that too. Uh, so anyway, and Jeff looks forward to the next webinar. Yeah. Hopefully we can do some more webinar content. But what I'd like to start with today is to go over things that are going on in our space out here in uh, not only on the take up, but what's going on in the industry. And I just want to do some follow up on some things that have happened really recently. Um, first thing is last week I talked to you guys about the uh, Here for Good program where commercial decorators have been getting together to help out small businesses that have had to shut down uh, due to coronavirus. And they've been essentially doing a program where you sell a garment that say do, do t-shirts. Mostly this is t-shirt printers right now, a lot of digital people, some screen print people. Um, 
who are essentially selling a shirt at 20 bucks, 10 bucks goes to the printer, 10 bucks goes to these closed down businesses. And they're using kind of the goodwill of the people who really want to frequent the businesses and keep them alive to keep sending direct money into these businesses. And I thought that was such a great idea that I just wanted to go ahead and kind of say, hey, that was a really cool thing going on. So I actually managed to, I'm kind of proud of this, I managed to grab Sloan Coleman, who really started here for good out in St. Louis, and get her on the Two Regular Guys podcast, uh, the podcast of which I am a uh, the producer and a, a frequent guest and or co-host. And that went on this morning. So I'm, if you uh, hear that I sound a little jangled today, it's like I've had a very busy day. Luckily, I got to take a break and uh, have some good conversation with uh, Brian. Once again, Creative and Brilliance, we have conversations very frequently. We were talking about some cool technical embroidery stuff. So that was fun. But between there, it's bracketed by some kind of crazy energy. But I did want to go ahead and say, if you want to hear more about that program, I would love for you to check out the regular guys podcast as well. Uh, producing that this morning. So I was behind the scenes. You won't see me on it. But uh, facebook.com slash two regular guys where you can get the replay and uh, really cool stuff from Sloan and discussing here for good. There's also a, a bit of, from the Impressions Expo people talking about what's going on with shows and stuff there at the beginning. But if you want to see the here for good stuff, that's a little bit further on where uh, Sloan really just digs into uh, her her take on here for good and community shirts, stuff that we talked about last week. So I like to follow that up and say, yeah, that is still going on. Uh, check out what's going on with her over at facebook.com slash two regular guys. And of course, uh, Tiny Little Monster is her uh, website, tinylittlemonster.com. That's their print shop. And um, that's where she's actually kind of doing her stuff, both for St. Louis and getting more information out to people. So interesting stuff on the two regular guys. You want to check that out. It's available now. That is uh, much earlier in the morning, but something else I was involved with. So that was pretty cool. And I really enjoyed that one. Actually, Christine comes in and she says, uh, that was a great podcast today. 2RG just had to let slang go and she ran with it. Yeah, like I said, uh, high energy, kind of going crazy, but it was really great. You know, it was, it was great. We went into bonus time, so it's a real long one. Like I said, if you want to just clip in on that segment and scrub through it, go for it. But Sloan was great, uh, did a good job, talked all about her passions with uh here for good and her passions when you're talking about design and uh, printing, which honestly, though we're in different media, we all know what it's like to be excited or jazzed by expression. And I know the people who are take up people, you guys who are on, on this, on this uh, journey with me, with the take up, I know that you guys are the same way. You know, you guys are keyed in, you are into the decoration, but that you're also here to do some good. Cause having seen the kind of commentary I'm hearing here, I know that you guys are here not just because you want to do embroidery and not just because you want to make money. Hopefully you do want to do both. Not that I don't have, I don't have any problem with the crafters being here too. Love you guys to be here. And some of you guys do the best art. I love when you guys stretch the medium and do all that cool work. Fiber artists and crafters are great, but I hope and I see that you people are all out here to do good and help people and to help them express themselves and celebrate events in their lives. And I think that that's amazing. So yeah, show was really great. Go ahead and see what's going on. Uh, over there at the Two Real Guys podcast. And I'm, once again, I'm gonna bring in Christine. I usually don't jump into comments. I'll probably try and go back and forth as we go to topics. But she jumps in and says, uh, add a Sloan to the uh, women in garment decoration family, which uh, made her really happy. You love her passion for uplifting women in the industry. Yeah, if you wanna check that out too on Facebook, Women in Garment Decoration. Don't have the link handy on a banner, but uh, great, great group that kind of started out of Two Real Guys, but Christine really brought this thing into its own. Uh, she also does quarterly shows at Two Real Guys where she brings on women from the industry to discuss. So uh, if you are a woman in the industry, go check that out on Facebook. Great thing to see and uh, great to see what's going on with Sloan there. So that was something I just wanted to bring up. Another thing that we talked about last week and that I'm going to continue on a little bit here is a uh, the Stay Strong Stitch On initiative, and that's something that we started over at Embrilliance, where we have uh, been ha hashtagging posts, Stay Strong Stitch On, and providing assets for everybody to go ahead and do just that, to go ahead and make things, especially for your uh, medical community, for first responders, for people who are out there serving kind of on the front lines of this thing. We've been providing free embroidery designs uh, and assets and projects also to keep people who are stuck in their home businesses with their machines, maybe with less work than they used to have, doing something that they feel is helpful, useful, and uh, that gives us all a sense of you know, contributing to this thing. So Stay Strong Stitch On has still been going on. If you're making things for people in that vein, uh, as we have been doing in the Brilliance community, please go ahead and use that hashtag, hashtag Stay Strong Stitch On. And what you're going to find is that we have continued on with that. And this is something we're doing like I said, with Brilliance, we have continued to uh, offer free designs. And I'm going to jump back and forth here because what I would like to do uh, is go ahead and show you guys what's going on right now. But if you go to this link that I'm putting up on the ticker one more time, uh, you're going to see that 
we have an entire category of posts that have different designs that are still up and running. And those things should be out there free for you guys to use. And I would like to encourage you to get out there, uh, use those designs, make stuff for your, uh, your initial community, the community of people who's working on this stuff. So as you see, we have all of these designs here. One of my last ones was this uh, Star of Life and a lovely Asclepius piece. So the rod of Asclepius here, once again, for the medical community, for nursing, for docs, for everybody. And these designs are freely downloadable and we want you to go ahead and make awesome things for your community. So if you go to that bit.ly link, you'll find in brilliance and stuff. And actually what's going to go off today has not posted yet, but will post shortly. We had uh, actually something from uh, take up attendee here and listener Jeff Fuller actually uh, contributed to it. And that was really cool. So uh, Jeff got, got together a design that I actually helped him make into a native design for our stitch artist community as well. And so some of that stuff was uh, is also coming in from other users. Originally, it was just me and Brian Bailey, creative room brilliance and um, Lisa Shaw, really, she kicked it off with her first design, which everybody really loved. It was a key fob design for those of you who do like home crafting or in the hoop stuff. You'll know how to do like in the hoop key fob designs. Um, those were really, really cool. Uh, stuff that came out, got people excited, got people grinding on it. And then now we've started to see uh, uh, Celeste Plache from one of our groups, from the Stitch Artist Group. She made some cool bookmark designs that have uh, nurses, doctors, and lab technicians on them. Lisa Shaw brought another one with, for lab technicians and scientists. And I've kept on with what are very traditional commercial designs. In fact, that uh, Star of Life you just saw is actually mapped out for hats. So if you're looking for a hat design for your EMS people, uh, also, we have no problem with you taking that stuff as a commercial embroiderer, or making hats or something and uh, that you have for sale for your people too, because you're servicing that industry. We would like to have you to have those resources that you need to do so. So like I'd say, uh, Jeff says, yes, stay strong, stitch on. Absolutely. It's what I want us to do. I know it is hard for us to be home or not in our usual work situations for those of us who are in full commercial shops. And for those of us in uh, home decoration, you're still seeing a massive drop off, especially if you had uh, event-based marketing is part of what you were doing or you were doing stuff for sports. So I know it's hard, but we have a chance here to use our equipment, to use our know-how to help out. So stay strong, stitch on, keep to it and keep doing it. And uh, Jeff says, thank you for making it native to and brilliance. Yeah, absolutely. I wanted to be able to give uh, the Stitch Artist community, which has a lot of these kind of prosumer is what I call them. These people who come up who are consumers, who then become professionals, who then become cottage industry people who are using stitch artists and using Embrilliance to do their work. And I wanted them to have a chance to enjoy that design as well. So that's what we've done. These are, these are native designs, but you can download them, make them into any sort of file format for any machine that you want to with a free program. So all of this stuff has really been offered for free. And like I said, there are other people out there now picking up that hashtag. If you follow the hashtag in general, you're going to be able to find more people doing good work. So like I said before, if you're doing something cool in embroidery and staying out there working, I would love for you guys to use the hashtag uh, stay strong, stitch on and show us what you're doing to keep working during all of this. And once again, if you would like to check out those free designs from the Brilliance folks and from me, you're going to get those at uh, bit.ly bit.ly uh, slash E-M-B-S-S-S-O. And that's where you're going to find it or go to imbrilliance.com to the project blog. So that is where we are with Stay Strong Stitch On. Like I said, I cannot thank you guys enough for participating in that and show us what you're doing because part of what keeps everyone going, especially when we get in these doldrums, we get into these dead periods where it's hard and maybe we're thinking we wanna improve ourselves, we wanna work, but it's hard to get the energy up. Seeing these inspirational posts, seeing people continuing to make things, seeing people making the masks, making design, doing uh, home sewn scrubs is another thing that's been happening. People are running out of scrubs, scrubs for scrubs, tops and bottoms for uh, people working in the medical industry and people are starting to help and sew and create. And if you can use embroidery to do that and make it something where people can be proud to wear it, where you can help someone identify them, give a gift to someone who is doing that kind of work, then that is awesome. So show us what you're doing, stay strong, stitch on. And with that, let's move out of kind of the current news and into the topics we're talking about today. We were talking about homework, working from home, leveling up. So let's go into those topics post haste, folks. But like I said, keep your Q&A coming. If you have any commentary, absolutely jump into the comments, say something and let me know how you feel about what's going on or if there's something we can help with. And that includes embroidery questions. If you wanna ask a full on technical embroidery question, uh, go ahead, embroidery and digitizing always on the table at the take up. So the first thing I'm gonna discuss here is actually from a current magazine article I've got out now. And this is out in printware. So I'm gonna go ahead and give you guys the link to it if you want it, uh, bit.ly, so there's another bit.ly link uh, slash level up PW. And this is really more about 
transitioning from hobby to business. But what I'm going to say is with so many people right now looking to move back into the home, honestly, I've seen people even in commercial spots who are kind of starting to think, what would I do? Uh, how would I like having a home-based business? Or would I like to have a secondary home-based production center, something that I can have at home? There are some good bits of information there, especially about machines and what you might need that are interesting. Also about handling digitizing, things like that, how you might do that for business. I teach an entire class on it. So it's not as long as like, say, if you guys have been out to the DAX classes, I have an in-depth class that goes into that uh, and really gets into whether or not you want to do digitizing. And I also have done some stuff for the impressions folks talking about the path from hobby to business. I got to do that at Long Beach. Sadly, we had to uh, postpone our, our other shows in between there, but we'll have to see how that chops up with all of this online education. But this article does give a little bit of a taste. It gives you a part of what I talked about in that from a hobby to business course that kind of gives you the ideas of what it's like, what you need to consider. So there are a few things I'd like to discuss with that. And what I'll actually do is pop us over to the article just so we can kind of see a couple of things I discussed in that hobby to business market. So this is the article from Printware and I will go ahead and pop it all the way up a little bit more zoomed in. It is primarily about finding machines, right? This is the Eric's embellishments comment uh, uh, column, which is sadly going away soon. As you guys may know, printware is going to be no more. But what I have, I can say is, though the time is uncertain right now, I, I may well be back in on the new magazine venture, Graphics Pro, that's coming from the same folks. That's something that they're looking to uh, very potentially have me in on as well. So you may, you're gonna see more from me one way or the other. And I'm still in Images Magazine UK uh, as soon as they're back up and printing, but you're gonna find me there as well. In any case, this first section is more about finding machines because some people have had some issues coming from that hobby to pro market. They'll discuss, you know, what can I do? Can I keep running a single needle machine? Can I keep running a home style machine? Can I keep running a pursuer machine if I want that machine to work for me commercially? And in this piece, we do have some points and I certainly show some machines and some things from the trade show floor. So you can kind of get an idea about that. Like, what is it going to be like to move from the home market into a more professional space. So let's briefly just go over a couple of the points that I bring up here. I'm not going to go super deep into, probably into the digitizing as much, but let's start a little bit with some of the points I brought up in this piece about moving from that hobbyist machine into a more commercial mode. And this is really what matters here for me. Go with these points. Uh, the first thing is ability, right? Can your current machine stitch the kind of items that are desirable to your customers. Uh, pretty frequently, even when we're talking about prosumer model machines, one of the things that people run into are limitations with caps. If your market is entirely hung up on doing 3D caps on super structured ca uh, caps in general, you've got a structured crown that has a very thick, dense plastic buckram in minute. If that's the kind of thing you're doing, flex fit hats are like this. You may find that working on a hobbyist level machine can be troublesome. That and actually some of the older hobbyist level machines also may have a smaller uh, decoration field in that area. So you're like, if I'm doing mostly uh, larger designs, especially hat designs, I know that I've got some people who are running some entrepreneurs, some older brother, uh, six needle, kind of prosumer machines, machines that are meant to be kind of in the home market, but really do go into that multi-needle space that is similar to a single head commercial machine. They actually have a limited vertical space that they can decorate. And sometimes people have trouble decorating hats, especially structured hats, when they're trying to do big designs or foam designs with those machines. So there is something to be said for, can this machine do that? Or people who wanna stick with kind of a single needle uh, flat bed machine, they look very much like a sewing machine. They're difficult to do tubular goods on to some degree. You have to roll shirts and small things out of the way. You have to have everything flat. Now, old commercial machines were like this too. I started out on machines that had spectacle frames, these little small round frames you dropped into what we call the spider web. And it would you would do just that. You take your polo shirt and roll the back out of the way so you didn't stitch through it. So it's, it's not like that's unheard heard of, but on a small machine that has a, a limited space underneath kind of the arm, it can be very difficult to run jackets or anything bulky if you're going to have to try and get it out of the way so that that needle has room. Uh, so there are some things that can limit you as far as that, or say something like bags. Uh, tons of people like to do bags or accessories. I've had some people do golf bags. And even with a commercial machine, you have to have a support system set up or uh, special tables or hanging that bag from somewhere to support the weight and the bulk while you're stitching on the top flap. One of the things you really do have to think about is what your market is. Now, certainly 
as we've talked about niche marketing and anything in that space, you also need to know what your customer needs. But once you know the kind of garments, the kind of objects that you're going to stitch, you have more of an idea of what you can do with a machine. And you'll know that home level machines, especially the sewing machine like machines, the machines that are uh, do not have that tubular frame underneath them where you can drop the garment out of the way where you have the cylinder arm that's inside of the garment. Um, those machines do have a certain amount of limitation and difficulty and they have a slower throughput, which we're going to talk about more. But yeah, certainly they have an ability that's different from a commercial machine and from a prosumer multi-needle machine. So the first thing is ability. Uh, can the machine I currently have, especially if I'm running on a home style machine, can it literally stitch on the kind of items that I need it to stitch on reliably? Can it do a good job? Can it create quality embroidery on the kind of garments, accessories, whatever that is that I want to stitch on reliably. That's the first thing. You have to get ability out of the way. Also, you, it has to be able without doing crazy time-consuming production things to the garment to get it to work. If it's not reasonable for us to do it, even if it's possible, if it's not reasonable, if we're thinking about moving into a commercial production space, and we're not talking about extremely high priced single items, but we're talking about trying to get some throughput, trying to get multiple commercial items through our chain in a day, uh, then looking at the kind of machines where we have to do a lot of work on each garment to make them work, uh, it might not be worthwhile. Have people done it? Absolutely, I would be surprised. Um, I would be super surprised in the commentary if someone didn't say, yo, I, I had a person who I knew ran, you know, multiple single needle home style machines for a chunk of their business. I would say there are still plenty of people who are doing that, but you will see over time that it kind of can affect your costs because it affects how much time things take, especially if you're doing clamping and crazy things to try and get everything out of the way. Nothing wrong with what the embroidery that the machines create. And quite frankly, some of them have features that are interesting that we can talk about as well. But, um, the, there is a certain sort of production threadability to be able to take garments on and off easily, to be able to run on objects that are large or heavy, or to be able to run through objects that are incredibly dense that is harder on a single needle machine. Often they have a single point of contact for the hoop as well, which means that as you get further away from the, from the place the hoop is mounted, you get some fluttering in the hoop. If something's really dense or you're going through super dense sticky material or something that is binding up on the needle, there's stuff you can do to mitigate that, but it does cause some issues that you don't get from a tubular hoop that's attached in two points. So you have to think about direct ability on the machine when you're talking about upgrading first. So that's something I absolutely want everybody to consider if they're coming from a more home-based place or if they have uh, especially the sewing machine styled equipment, right? Now we're not talking about this and I'm gonna go ahead and pop that, that article back up again. The two machines I'm showing you here, on the left is a prosumer style machine, certainly. that It's got a plastic case on it, which if you're talking to commercial people, they look at a plastic case machine and kind of look at it funny and you know, with no good reason because the internals are often that way. And what I'm gonna tell you is that prosumer machine you're seeing right there is right next to a fully commercial multi-head machine and it's being shown by a, a, a commercial company. So that was on the trade show floor of a commercial venue. So this is not like we're not seeing prosumer kind of machines, small tabletop machines in the commercial space. We absolutely are and for multiple reasons. Um, especially I'm seeing them used in event-based decorating. Back before all this crisis happened, people were doing live on-site decorating. They were doing customizing monogramming and working on uh, stuff that was events inside of stores. People really liked those prosumer machines for that because part of the ability there is the ease of use, which we're gonna talk about next. Part of it actually wasn't that ease of use that you would think of from running the machine itself. It was the ease of use in the fact that these were light enough that you could carry them up a flight of stairs as necessary, put a couple of them in the back of a minivan and take them somewhere with your supplies and do on-site decoration, personalization, names, monograms, and so forth. So there are multiple reasons why you might wanna go with say a prosumer machine versus a full single head commercial machine. There may be reasons for that. Um, but what I would say is you certainly need to look at ability when you're talking about a sewing machine style machine. They're great for craft embroidery, uh, but I would say in production, most of the time they are a bit slower and they're going to have some ability issues with certain kinds of garments and accessories. More versatility is gonna be had from the multi needles. Just that is the case as far as I've uh, my experience has been. Like I said, somebody may come in the comments and say, I've been running everything on those and you probably have been, but for me, I find that uh, most operators have time constraints that cause that to be a little difficult. Uh, the second thing I would like to bring up outside of ability is ease of use. Ease of use, and there's multiple things we can talk about the ease of use. 
Um, certainly, we're, we did talk about already the threadability, and that is ease of use. The ability to get garments on and off of a machine is certainly part of it. But there are, there's some actually some competing sides on ease of use as well. One of the other things I've seen people say about the prosumer level machines is that they have things that a standard commercial, especially commercials of any age that haven't been around, you know, the ones that are out in the market that maybe use commercials don't have it all, uh, that you have in prosumer machines like awareness of a hoop. Uh, I was shocked the first time I used a prosumer machine and it knew which hoop was registered to the machine and it knew uh, not to ding the hoop with a needle. If you are somebody who's been working on commercial machines, you know that a machine expects you to understand what hoop is on and to trace or understand the extents of your design. And if you run out past it, you can absolutely drive a needle into a hoop, break a reciprocator, or cause other damages to your machine. Uh, commercial machines often expect you to know what to do, where the, where the prosumer ones may not. Problem being is the prosumer ones are also uh, potentially slower and may not be uh, you know, quite as robust as the commercial machines, especially like you're doing stuff like super um, high constructed hats that have dense buckram in them, 3D foam. Uh, I've had people doing horse tack, big pieces of leather, stuff like that, where they want the power of one of the commercial machines instead. Those things certainly balance out, but ease of use is real. You can also have things related to the way your shop runs that affect ease of use. And once again, I'll pop over to that photograph real quick, just because I want you to take a look. Once again, we've got these, uh, the Melco machines here. There's, these are interesting. And you also have a similar system. I know ZSK has a system uh, ZSK machines, very high-end commercial machines, lovely machines. Uh, they also have a system by which you can use multiple single heads and tie them together for production. Uh, Melco has been doing it for a very long time as well and have also been pretty active in the prosumer space in between kind of consumer and professional. Uh, they will do kind of a networking thing where they tie machines together. And I've seen more and more people building up fleets of single heads so that they have a very versatile set of machines instead of these slightly less expensive per head, but uh, more capacity, multi-heads. Multi-heads, as you know, if you are running one of the heads on a multi-head, it absolutely has to be running everything. If you have to only run one design on it, you're shutting down the rest of your heads and that production is lost. Whereas on a uh, on a chained up set of networked single head machines, you could run different items. You can switch between them. Certainly you have to, uh, sometimes if you're not doing this through any sort of networking software, you're going to be administering them yourself, uh, loading designs on each one and starting and stopping them yourself. That may be the issue there with management. But when you have software that networks them and uh, remote controls them, you can get a lot more done. Uh, but what I will say is because of the order on demand, single piece, high personalization, low quantity market that people have been getting into, uh, the chains of multi-heads, the multi-head fleet is certainly coming up and you'll see more people using these multi-heads that are networked together in some fashion. Like I said, ZSK has an awesome system. I saw uh, fairly recently at trade shows and Melco has been doing it for some time. So you'll see more Melco machines. Like I said, in that prosumer cottage market, the other thing people do pretty frequently when they're using these chain sets of uh, single head machines, they can actually configure them in different ways in smaller spaces. Whereas trying to throw a couple of 12 heads into your garage may be a real problem for you or into your spare bedroom, you might be able to get you know five, six single heads arranged around a room in a way that makes more sense, especially if there are physical obstructions or the room isn't very large. So for people who are trying to work with different smaller spaces, I've seen them consider a, a multi-set, right? a fleet of single heads instead of using a multi-head when they're trying to increase capacity. So I know a lot of us are really, when you're talking about hobby to business, you're probably thinking about your first head in that game. But when you want to think about multi-head machines or, or larger capacity, the ability to network is something you might want to take a look at because networking single heads together can make them act more like a multi-head machine. Uh, so certainly ease of use is there. So ease of use both uh, in the features it has, does it have some sort of features to help you with alignment? If you are someone who is not a skilled uh, embroider using some sort of alignment tools or alignment aids might be helpful to you. Um, maybe having that automatic trace or cameras or any of those features that you see in the prosumer level machines. I've seen people say, you know, yes, I'm sacrificing some speed. Yes, I'm sacrificing some ability, but I have this machine that I can put a fairly unskilled user on and they can do their work a little easier. Uh, that's an argument you can make. Uh, certainly I am dyed in the wool commercial. I tend to really like a commercial machine. I like to have a uh, 
more control over some things. Like you'll see that some of the uh, prosumer machines or the, uh, actually the Malcolm machines have some active feed technology. They've got tensioning that's controlled uh, electronically. I like to do my tensioning manually. Um, some of that stuff differs from machine to machine. So for me, I, I tend to like a commercial machine that's uh, funny enough, a little dumber. I like a machine that where it knows that I'm doing the work, but some people will like a machine that has some of these increased features and truthfully having uh, used prosumer machines in my recent life, um, it's, it's surprising how much they can get done. I mean, it's not like the embroidery itself, the quality of the embroidery itself is not vastly different and they are able to run uh, very similarly. So ease of use is part of that. You do have to think about where you fit in that camp. Um, do they fit into your actual shop format? Do they fit into your throughput, your work? Do they have the ability they have? And do they have an ease of use for operators and for you that makes sense? Is it easy to operate? Does it have all of the tools and accessories you need as well? Uh, the other thing you're going to find is if people are getting into higher end decoration or multimedia decoration, if you wanna have things like laser attachments, heat cutting attachments, sequins, beads, things like that, you're gonna be looking at a commercial machine. So if you're say going to be doing do home decor, there are people doing home decor, fashion, other sorts of boutique decoration, you're doing that, uh, you're going to be wanting to look at a machine that has attachments like that, like the ZSK machines. If you've ever been to the ZSK booth, uh, they frequently feature those kind of machines. So you'll see attachments for hot cutting patches and applique. You're going to see laser attachments for some of these machines. You will see uh, beading or sequin reels attached to one needle of the machine that allows them to do this multimedia work. Uh, it's not for everybody. It's a special use case. But if that is your use case, it absolutely changes the ability score, if you want to put it that way for those machines and puts you in that commercial camp. So uh, the third thing I'd like to discuss on that, and let me bring myself back up here, uh, production capacity. Now, if you look at the image behind me that's on my uh, lovely green screen, once again, big uh, multi-head ZSK machine, production capacity is a thing. Now I'm not talking about, are we rolling into multiple 12 head machines immediately out of our hobby world? However, it is worthwhile thinking about how much production capacity you have. Um, absolutely. There is a difference between the speeds you can attain with a prosumer machine uh, than you can get with a home machine. The home machines tend to be a little slower. So that is one of the things you wanna look at, production capacity. What am I gonna be able to actually get on and off that machine fast? Now that also has to do, like I said before, with ability, with the way things are set up. So I will say certainly, uh, can you make these things happen for yourself otherwise? Yes, you can. Can you get up to production capacity on, on, a, um, on a prosumer machine? Yes, you can. Uh, plus, what the real kicker is, is that any of these things can be profitable. You can be profitable at any level of these things if your pricing is right and if you can instill the value of your product to your customer. So that's something you need to think about is that value is part of it. Pricing is part of it. All of these things are dependent on your model, the way you show value to a customer and what they perceive as the way things should run. So honestly, that's one of the things you gotta look at. Production capacity certainly is a deal. If you are already scraping up against the limits of what your machine can do at the speed it can, then absolutely that's something you need to look at. Now I wanna jump to the comments because I see some interesting stuff going on in the comments over here and I can't help but uh, jump in on this stuff. So yeah, if we look at this stuff, uh, Brian Bailey, once again, creative and brilliance comes in. Uh, absolutely. The brother PR deb debuted about 85 pounds, not light, but a feather by comparison. Absolutely. You can't compare moving that machine to moving a commercial single head. So if I were trying to go into a department store and set up an event, I'm much more likely to start with one of these or to look at, like I said, the Tajima Sai is what we were looking at. I'm not advertising. I don't have any machine connections necessarily. Um, as you see, I do love the ZSK machines. It's a machine that I, you'll see me hanging around the booth a lot. So I will talk about them, but also it's because they have awesome attachments and fun stuff that I like to look at. Uh, Bill says, yeah, try to get a multi-head into a basement. Yeah, I have seen this happen. It is difficult. Uh, working with big multi-heads, they are really hard. And watching someone crane one up onto a second or third floor where there's no access is not exactly a pleasure cruise either. So the big multi-head machines are huge and hard to move around, whereas a fleet of singles are a little easier, and especially with that kind of uh, work. So very interesting stuff. As Christine says, Christine uh, from Enmart, you may know her from uh, myenmart.com, all the supplies that she sells, but also you have to realize the parent company is Instant Emblem. People who do 
thousands upon thousands upon thousands of emblems patches every day. Um, and the parent company, she's talking about Ensign, actually pulled out a wall in the warehouse to move a 30 head. Yeah, 30 head. That's bigger than I've worked on, folks. I've never worked on a 30 head. So I feel I have to go, oh, 30 head, that's that's huge. Me, I, I really was stuck to the 12s. That's about as big as I ever did. It was multiple 12s, but uh, never a 30 head machine. Huge machines. But Jeff, and I agree with this, you'd be amazed what a home user with a will to have an industrial attachment can acquire using a 3D printer and some duct tape. Absolutely. Um, like I said, it's not that you cannot do sequining or other stuff at home or that you can't do. I mean, I've seen open source projects making all kinds of crazy stuff uh, and people making their own embroidery machines out of sewing machines. You can. This is more about what is commercially viable, uh, what's going to cost you, what's going to take your time. If your time and ingenuity are something you have a surplus of, absolutely. You want to Mag MacGyver some stuff together, as Brian puts later. Uh, he says, uh, sounds like you have some experience, MacGyver. Uh, yeah, no, if you want to put something together, you absolutely can. And let me tell you, uh, it is a long-standing tradition to make jigs and hooping jigs and methods of attachment and clamps to hold different items. I have done it. We've all done it. What I tend to tell people is if it's something that's business critical that you're going to be using all the time, make sure that if you are putting it together, that if, if it is a bodge job, make it a really good bodge job and know what you're going to do if and when it fails or if you have to make custom parts. Uh, for production, you do want to make sure you're there. But I absolutely agree. And Jeff, if you really are making some articles on putting stuff together, I would absolutely like to see those. Like I said, the home and prosumer machines have capability that makes them production ready. They have some drawbacks, but they also have some things that are really a, a leg up. And especially if we're talking about some of the other things that you have to think about, um, these are the two things that I, that what, one of the things I always say is that there are reasons why you might select a machine that don't have to make sense to everybody else because they are in your shop. Your shop is what has to be the focus for you. Your method of operation has to be your focus. And for me, the two things to look at when you're picking any machine are support and repair. And this is any machine, any brand, prosumer, home, commercial, any level, support and repair are important for selecting a machine. Uh, number one, what kind of official and un unofficial support are you going to get? If you have official support, what is the company going to help you with? Do they help with training? Do they have uh, technicians that are available to you? Are they available in your area? How much will it cost for you to fly someone out to fix your machine? Especially commercial people, we know this. We have to fly techs out and put them up so that we can get our machines worked on and often have to get ourselves on a service trip with other uh, embroiderers to kind of get that cost defrayed rather, or, or at least uh, amortized over um, several people. You have to kind of spread that cost out. Uh, so support is one of the things. Certainly official support, documentation, education, uh, what are they going to do and help with me? Also, repair support. Like I said, the support in the repair side, technicians, the availability of technicians, and the availability of parts. And the reason I bring up the availability of parts is that some people will buy um, a used machine and have some trouble with it, or they'll go and get a sweet deal on a used machine not knowing that there is no part availability, especially in electronics, when the electronics go out to that machine as a paperweight. Um, unfortunately, that is just one of the things that can happen to you. And I've brought this up many times before. I love the older brother commercial machines. My favorite toy and uh, my partner in crime for doing most of my work when I was young was a brother BAS 415 uh, nine needle embroidery machine, lovely machine. And it was just a, it's a single head commercial made my brother and they don't make them anymore. There are no parts for them. I see them on sale for inexpensive, you know, absolutely inexpensively all the time. And I want one. I am constantly looking for that BAS 415 uh, because I try not to want to buy one of those suckers. I always think about it. And then I realize I'm like, as soon as something goes out, especially if one of the boards goes out, I'm on my own. Also, what I'm going to say, when you are first coming up into embroidery as a commercial operator, you may find yourself saying, okay, man, I'm butting my head against all these problems. I can't get this to look right. The tension's kind of not right. I find like I've got something going on with thin columns here. I find that there's something wrong with my horizontal registration all the time and I can't really figure it out. When you're using a used machine, especially if you've gone bargain basement, you buy a machine that may not have a lot of support, you're not really sure about how it's been maintained. You don't know if you're having, say, digitizing problems. Say you're learning to digitize at the same time. Am I having a digitizing problem or a design problem or am I having a machine problem? And if you don't have a lot of experience, you may not know. 
So that's the other part of having a used machine. I'm not saying don't buy a used machine, especially if you know what you're doing. If you know how embroidery machines should run, you know about its service record, and you've got a good idea of the support you have for it, or it's being sold by a reseller that's going to guarantee it or some such, uh, used machines can make sense. And I'll say in my uh, commercial life, we really only bought used machines after a while. We bought used machines because we were used to running the machines, and uh, we looked for kind of low stitch count used machines, low like machines that aren't were not that old that we could run. And that's what we ran at the last commercial shop I worked at. However, this is from people who had tens of years of experience. They understood what was going on with the machines. They knew the relative value of the machines and they were aware of who they were going to use as a technician and had regular service people coming out to work with them. If you're somebody in a, in a brand new home shop and what you're buying is somebody's used machine that's been sheltered somewhere, hopefully it's been sitting in a storage unit for a while with all of its uh, vital fluids pooling up at the lowest point, you may not be getting what you think you're getting for that hot deal. And especially if you have something where the parts availability is not great. So know your model number, know your age, find out parts ability, see or, uh, parts availability, find out who can service it and be aware of that. So. Look for official support from the company, unofficial support from a vibrant community of users, people who use the machine, uh, and absolutely look at how hard this thing is going to get to be, you know, be to get repaired. That's something to think about. So let's move on from that. So that's the machine stuff. That's something that I wanted to discuss because a lot of people lately have been getting into it. I was surprised to find that with everything going on as it has been, and honestly with businesses struggling, one of the things I heard were people saying, okay, I'm going to leave my semi-commercial spot or my industrial spot I'm going to set up at my home to make sure I can't get shut down. And then now I can compete in a different way. Also, they were saying, I'm going to go to these small shops that are shutting down and I'm going to, when the fire sales start happening because of the tragedy, because of the shutdowns and layoffs, I'm going to buy up some single head used equipment and I'm going to start a home-based business out of that. Um, Hey, there are opportunities in a down market. I cannot tell you that there aren't. And I've seen lots of shops who are were home based already where I and I can see some of them feel vindicated because they're looking at the commercial shops that are currently not allowed to go to their shops and run with multiple employees and saying, I can still run out of my basement, out of my garage. And they have a point. I mean, th there is a reason why that's working out for them right now. But I thought I would go ahead and discuss machinery because the other thing that's happening is people who are at home, who are, say, embroidery enthusiasts themselves may be thinking, here's a business I can run while I'm laid off. Here's something I can do from the house. And I want to go ahead and buy into equipment, maybe while it's cheap, maybe while I can get loans or while that's going to work out for me, or if I've got some nest egg built up and I think I can do that. I just want to make sure that you guys go about it the right way. So think about the capacity of your machine, what it's capable of doing, uh, how easy it will be to use for you and how much lead time is going to take you to figure out how to use it if you're going to go for commercial, uh, commercial sales and work and you have to rely on it. Uh, think definitely about the throughput. How many uh, garments can I get through this thing in a day? How does that affect what I need to price to be profitable? Uh, and absolutely, whatever you're looking at, whatever kind of machine, whatever condition it's in, make sure that you have support for it in one way or another, official support, unofficial support, that you'll be able to learn how to use it easily. And think about what it's going to take to repair it once it becomes something critical to you making your money. So think about those things with machines. And I think that's where we're going to leave that portion of that today. The last stuff I'd like to talk about, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, working from home. And this is something that certainly I have done many times and I do regularly, but I'll say I also don't do incredibly well. I sometimes have problems working from home and have to reestablish myself after I get a little bit uh, lax about the things I'm going to tell you to do. But it's why I called this one homework. A lot of us are stuck kind of working from home and making the best out of this situation. And I thought there'd be some good things that we could discuss in order to prepare ourselves better for what we need to do and to make the most of this time we have right now, especially if we are finding ways to work on our businesses from home. And one of the first things I think everybody should do, if you're forced to work from home and you can't be in your usual commercial space, or if you just don't have the kind of usual space you, you are used to, or maybe you're working from home and just finding that you're not as productive as you'd like to be, or that you have some concerns there, I would say, um, Number, th number one thing, establish some boundaries and routines. If you're having trouble kind of staying separated, trying to keep your home life, your family life, your work life apart, a great thing you can start with is establishing some boundaries. If you can establish a physical boundary, and I mean a room, if you can make a home office or a spare room into the office and say, 
once I am beyond this door, I am at work. It doesn't mean that you can't contact me, that I don't uh, love you, people in my family who are coming to the door, not that I won't come out or take a lunch break or do the things that I would do at work. But inside of this room, if I am at work, if I'm working, this is what I'm doing. I'm currently at work. It's like, go ahead and you can contact me and I can get back to you, but this is a place where I'm working. A physical boundary can be something that's useful for that, especially if you find yourself constantly dragged into the business of the home while you're there. Not everybody's going to have that ability. Uh, some of it will also just be some sort of boundaries that you establish with people where you say, especially, like I said, if you are still able to work, but you are stuck at the house shelter in place, talking to the other people in your family and saying, hey, from this hour to this hour, I am doing this kind of work. Whether it's my full work day or I have a section of time I'm blocking off, I'm establishing a boundary and saying, I am at work at this point. Maybe even selecting a calendar and saying, this is when I will be there. You can look at the calendar if I'm at work, if I'm taking a call, or if I'm, say you're somebody like me, I used to digitize from home when I was sick. Uh, I was the only digitizer for my company. Um, I had to do all of that setup, all of the e-commerce myself, and I was really the only person who knew how to handle that stuff. So I would establish a remote working situation for myself where I would say I must work sometimes even when I'm sick to get these things done. And that's really where I started learning how to establish boundaries and say, okay, from this time to this time, I am at work. Um, now, establishing routines. This is where I fall off sometimes. I tend to be a bit of a night owl and you'll catch me at two in the morning, you know, doing testing on our software uh, like I have been doing lately or working on fonts or working on assets or posting or doing setting things up for our e-commerce. Um, the thing I will say is if you have trouble, if you're finding yourself not accomplishing tasks the way you want to, one of the easiest things to do is establish a work day. So go ahead and say, I have a work day that I want to accomplish this much. And this is the kind of hours it takes me to do that on any normal time if I'm in my office. So even if, like I said, even if you're already working at home, you just find yourself not being able to get things done the way you want to, what you probably find is if you take track of your time, uh, I know Terry Combs, two other guys in doing production work, he had a point where um, to learn this stuff, he wrote down every 15 minutes what he was doing in a log book. You could do that too. But tracking your time might help. And certainly the very lowest uh, thing you can do, the very lowest barrier to entry kind of thing you can do is to establish a work day and say, OK, from this hour to this hour, I am at work. And more is the better if you can establish those boundaries as well and say to your spouse, to your kids, to your loved ones, whatever, hey, this is the time at work or physical boundaries and say, Behind this door of the spare room, if the door is closed, it means that I am currently at work, not on break and trying to get things done. And frankly, even when you are a sole proprietor working on your own business, because you are the boss, sometimes people will say to you, you can do what you want when you want to do it. The problem is that you really do need that time to work. And I'm going to say, it looks like I'm joined in by a couple other night owls here. We have Christine jumping in. I'm a total night owl. I find myself writing things late at night and not going to sleep when I should. Same here, and that's actually not great. Like last week, I told you guys to take care of yourselves. I'm not always great taking care of myself either, but we do have to make sure that we at least do take care of ourselves to some degree. But I'm going to say, yeah, sleep sleep is for the weak or when you're dead. Apparently, that's what I always feel like. I, I, don't, I don't sleep very much myself, but I find that every once in a while, it means I absolutely have to sleep more than I should. Here's Jeff also. Sleep is overrated. Well, for a while. I couldn't have read that at a better time. Absolutely. It is just the case that if you don't sleep, if you don't take care of yourself, eventually you will have some health issues crop up or you will just be so exhausted that you'll find yourself repeating work that you were trying to do once, two, three times, stopping and starting, not being effective. And you need to realize uh, setting that up and being careful about it is important. Uh, Jeremy, by the way, Jeremy Picker of Amber Creative, great to have him on. Yeah, so hard. I put three tips together well. Uh, go outside and get some fresh air before you sit down to start work. Yeah, a little break, getting some separation. That's also kind of establishing boundaries. If you're having trouble getting out of your space, go out, take the walk and come back and like that's your commute up here. Let's commute to work. That's a great way to do it. Uh, take a shower and get dressed. Absolutely. In my next step about preparing, that's something I say for me, it's shoes. If I don't have shoes on, I'm not at work for some reason. I'm not even sandals. Doesn't count. Sandals or slippers. If shoes aren't on, I'm not at work. Absolutely. Uh, and three, break away to journal or meditate or just take a walk. Yeah, take some breaks. We're going to talk about that again. Also, you have to have to do that. And here, Brian, and I know because Brian Bailey and I have had many a 2 a.m., 1, 1 a.m. discussion, both in person and over Skype. Uh, my best breakthroughs happen when the family is all in bed. Absolutely. In those silent hours, in the, uh, watch, the late watches, the early hours of the morning. Absolutely. Same here. I get some of my best work done sometimes. So there's a... Uh, 
Bill, I've only seen two or three sunrises in my life, and I saw those because I was still awake. Well, yeah, that's kind of how I feel. I tend to, I would rather probably sleep a little in the morning or do two phases of sleep. But yeah, Jeremy, yeah, shoes, absolutely, that's me. Shoes, put on shoes. Now, if you're the kind of person that's wearing wear shoes inside the house, put on slippers or something. For some reason, for me, that is my key to say I am going on. And what I think about, you guys know, as a medievalist, it makes me think of a Germanic medieval poetry or. Uh, saga literature, we have what we call an arming scene. And they do it in movies too, where you get ready, you get strapped up, you put on the armor, you put everything on. And at the last moment, you put the helmet on and you charge into battle. Well, for me, that is tying my shoes. When I was a kid, I wore big red wing boots or combat boots. And the last thing, lacing up those shoes and out the door I went. And I think that that's stuck in my head. So whatever it is for you guys, have your arming scene, put on your armor and gird yourself for battle and get out there and do your work. So yeah, arming yourself up, getting ready, whatever it is that makes you feel prepped, go ahead and do that for your prep. So yeah, establish boundaries and routines, folks. That is what we start with, but then prepare. The other thing to do is get ready the night before. Get ready for your day today, the night before. Go ahead and set up lists and know what your top priorities are. Starting is often the hardest part. And so that's one of those things you have to deal with, right? Um, absolutely, there are some issues that come with that. You need to make sure that you have everything prepared and also prepare your space. And I, you know what? This is something I want to talk about just briefly. Um, one of the things I found everybody not preparing for is their software. Because I work in software, you guys know that I'm going to think about this. I've had some people saying, we got sheltered in place and I'm not going back to the office, but I don't have my dongle for my digitizing software. Uh, I'm lucky because in Brilliance doesn't have dongles. We can run copies at home and otherwise. Also, luckily, I, we don't have problems with, you know, people using multiple installs for that kind of stuff. So that's that's nice for me. But I've had some people where they have a software that has a dongle on it and they're very upset that they have to carry it around. It's very expensive to replace. There really is such a thing as dongle insurance. I know I've talked about it before and I get a lot of laughs and giggles about dongle insurance. But yes, you can insure your dongle because it's expensive to replace and difficult. Um, but yeah, you need to prepare your space to make sure you have all the tools you need. Like I said, whether that's your software dongle, whether that's the mouse that you use for digitizing, whether that's your notebook full of ideas, whether that's your schedule or your passwords, your logins, or if it's your preparation for what you need to do. All of these things are things you should be thinking of before you work, not after you start working. So you need to prepare before you work. Uh, like I said, once again, uh, whatever it is you need, set up your space. I like to think about this with, and it's with embroidery, it's with digitizing, it's with business. I like mise en place. I like the place around me to be set up where if I had to, I could close my eyes, I could reach out right now and I could grab the headset that I need to take a call. I could reach out right now and grab my color chart for my thread. I could reach right now and grab uh, you know, a trimmer if I'm sitting at my machine. No matter where you are, the things that you use the most should probably be close to you. And this is mentally too, no matter when you start your work for the day, you should know what your top priorities are and know what you have to get done and have the supplies ready on hand. Great thing to do at the end of the day when you're starting to wind down and you feel like I'm not gonna be ready to do any more work, start to prepare for the next day and get things done ahead of time because then a future you will thank current you or you will thank past you the next day for the preparation you had and the running away to get things going. So this also includes prioritizing folks. You have to prioritize the kind of things that you need to get done in a day. Make sure you know what your top three are. And I would say when we're having things like this, we're retired and we're trying to give ourselves a little leeway. Um, it's cool to have a little bit of work that you do before eating the frog. Well, you know, we call it eating the frog when you take on your biggest, hairiest, awful thing that you need to get done and get it done early and first. Um, that can help you to keep the dread away. If you're somebody who procrastinates or has dread over a task, jumping on it can help you. But it's okay, even if you're doing your priorities, to lead in a little bit and give yourself a little time, especially when we're working from home and we're out of sorts, to give yourself that boundary space. Or like Jeremy said, take that walk and come back. Uh, the next thing, delegate. I know it sounds weird, especially if you're, if you're a sole proprietor, you really can't do a lot of this. But if you can engage anybody to help with something, especially if you're working at home, during the time that you are at work on the job, you probably don't need to be taking phone calls from the house phone. You don't need to be dealing with picking up packages, junk like that. Things that if you can, if you have someone else to help you, delegate the stuff that is not uh, necessary to have your specific hands on it. So I, I am terrible at this. I take things over. Uh, so I have to learn this one myself too. But when you can delegate, delegate, train and delegate uh, either in your business or in your life, if you can ask for help when you need it, especially now. Um, this is a time when we can look at what we're doing. And the other thing is about the same thing about prioritizing. Sometimes what we find is that we are putting too much emphasis on things that are uh, emergent, but they're not really urgent. They're just starting to happen. And we feel like we have to answer them in a, in a 
reactive fashion, but they're not actually urgent. They don't need to be done. These can either be things that you put off until later deliberately because you can wait till later or that you delegate. So those are good things too. I want to grab some more comments here because we have some other people going on. Uh, so let's just see what's going on here. Um, <laughs> so why does ensure your dongle sound naughty? That is up to you. I'm not going to address it because every time we get into the dongle talk, somebody starts making bad jokes. But let's see here. Uh, worse, it's important if you're in the business. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bad answers for why things are important, folks. It's kind of hard to deal with this stuff. Everything feels important when it's er emergent, but it's not always urgent. And Brian's right there. So uh, good to see you here, Ramona. Working up a batch of masks. Very nice. Awesome. Stay strong. Stitch on. Keep helping out. And yeah, yes, you must prioritize. This is a hard one to do, especially when something feels urgent or feels urgent to us or it feels important to us. Or if we're procrastinators, we may take on the things that suit us well that we want to do or that feel good to do, feel like we're knocking down tasks, but aren't the most important. So you got to prioritize for several reasons, but prioritizing the day before for the next day really will help you get a good start on the day. And Ramona says, I have three dongles, one insured, one travel, and one I'm scared to touch. This is why I'm super glad that Imbrilliance doesn't have a dongle because I pick up on any of my machines and I have my install of Stitch Artist rocking at any time. I don't have to really worry about it. Um, I do have dongles for other software. I have had dongles for every you know manner of software you can imagine because I've run just about everything. But I do admit I'm very spoiled now that, because I'll just jump up into Stitch Artist like that from whatever machine I'm on. And I, I'm happy to not do dongles right now, certainly. So uh, yeah. I only have one. I'm going to need to get into this multiple dongle technology. Uh, if you have to, like I said, I'm pretty happy to not have one right now for my primary workspace. I, I'm glad to not have to worry about dongle insurance. <laughs> anyway, whatever it is though, guys, take care of your equipment and make sure it is prepared and where it needs to be, certainly. Uh, the last couple of things I want to talk about uh, before I go into, I'm probably going to go into a couple of minutes of bonus time here, but I want to go through these last points about working at home. One of the things, uh, entertain yourself. I'm not saying goof off necessarily, but I'm not not saying goof off. Some of the best things I've done in my career are from what I'll call self-directed uh, self projects is what you might often hear when you're talking about to, uh, like uh, graphic designers will say this, they have a self-directed project. Entertain yourself, especially if you can do it in a way that is productive. Say we're finally getting to the point of burnout. You don't want to just burn out, get tired and binge Netflix. But hey, let's say you haven't heard the rest of the episodes of The Take Up. You could go watch the other nine of those or you could go jump on some educational stuff. There are tremendous educational abilities right now. People are offering free Skillshare classes and free uh, LinkedIn learning or lynda.com classes. There's a bunch of people out there right now casting lives because they're at home. So educators like me are going live more than I have ever seen in my life. People who are Luddites, who do not really work online that much, who weren't in social media, are now on StreamYard going live at alarming rates and sharing everything they know because they're at home. They're not at trade shows. They're not out teaching anything else. And there's also tons of paid experiences which are either um, less expensive or they're just ones that are becoming available that weren't available before because we're looking to move things that were on the trade show floor out into the internet because we can't go together anymore and be at the trade shows. With the trade shows being canceled, there's all sorts of things that are entertaining and informative that are either free or cheap or available that weren't available before. So entertain yourself. Absolutely do some self-directed projects if you can. Uh, work on some things that are great sample material to show people. Because as I've said many a time, uh, unfortunately, a lot of our clients don't have a lot of vision. I would say 80 something percent of them don't have a ton of vision. If you show them a sample, though, they will know what they like and what they want when they see it. So making some samples of things, that, the kind of work you want to do that is either profitable for you, you think is interesting, might catch people. It's a good time to do that now. And when you're working at home is a special time to say, okay, on breaks, I'm going to walk away for a second and entertain myself. And honestly, there are times where you need a full breather, when you need a full break. And that's why I want to go to the last point here. Know your limits. This is hard to do. I'm not great at it either. I will take on work and take on work until I collapse. And so I have to sometimes stop and say, all right, it's okay that I don't say yes to everything. I think saying yes to projects is awesome. But I think especially when we are sole proprietors, when we work from home, uh, when, uh, since I talked about going from hobby to pro earlier, if this is something you love doing, like when you catch me, when I am in hobby mode, I'm still embroidering. I'm still digitizing. I'm still teaching. I'm still talking. Why? Because this is what I like to do as well as what I live to do and what I do for a living. Uh, Brian will attest to this, that he and I get into these deep discussions about embroidery. And sometimes I don't know if we're working on project stuff or not. I mean, often it ends up as part of our product because we get to these great ideas and Brian, or Brian will bring me a cool idea. And then we start to spitball out 
work out a sample. Um, but frequently, this is something I'm doing as a hobby and I will forget my limits and forget when I'm about to crash. So there is a point where you need to start pulling yourself, ask yourself, stop and have a moment and say, am I going for burnout? Am I going for a crash? Do I need a break? Know those limits, especially if you are not feeling well or if you're dealing with a lot of stress and a lot of us are, especially with business the way it is right now. It's okay to take breaks when you need them. It's okay to stop for a minute. Um, even if you're doing cool stuff, even if you're doing something you love, there are times where you're going to exhaust yourself on it. Uh, also realize that the well of creativity that you're relying on, if you don't ever take in anything new, if you're always dipping into that well and making and making and making and doing more content and creating and working, 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 it will exhaust itself. You need time to reflect. You need time to let the things in your mind congeal, all these different inputs you have, the stuff you're learning here, the stuff you're learning from other people in classes, the things you learn when you're doing your projects. You need some time to do something else, whether it's taking a walk, playing some music, taking a break, taking a nap, to literally just let this stuff steep in the back of your head, let yourself process. The other thing is sleep. Sleep is good for us. It's where we form memories, at least to the best of our ability. What we understand is that memories are formed during sleep and that we do some processing on the things we've learned in the day during sleep. If you're a night owl like me, you need to make sure you get at least some sleep or more sleep than you are now probably to let these things go. So know when your energy is getting low. Though I have to bring a couple other things in here as well. Uh, Lacey mentioned says, uh, I've been super busy lately doing funny shirts that are heat pressed. People need humor at the moment. Yes. And that's fine too. That's good to do breaks, do something different, do some self-directed projects, but yeah, do, do check that out. I mean, it's hard when the lines are blurry and Brian Bailey, once again, creative and brilliant. So we know he is spending plenty of time on embroidery. Uh, the lines for us are blurry. Uh, Eric and I talked embroidery for years before I came on, just hanging out at Starbucks. Yeah. We would sit at Starbucks. I, and like I said, years before I became a part of the company, we were talking embroidery, talking about software, talking about the way things work, talking about stitch types, just working on this cool stuff. But at the same time, like those lines being blurry means that sometimes I know Brian and I both push ourselves really hard and occasionally we'll, you know, not take breaks. And I think the thing is we get inspiration from the other inputs that are outside of embroidery that come to us. They come from reading and history and art and pop culture and media and sleep and talking and everything that we do with each other too. So we have to have that other input and not just work all the time. And Christine says, and I, I'm going to go and bring her up as well. Uh, don't forget to ask for support or help if you need it, especially if you're an educator, people turn to you for advice and help. I'll try and listen, Christine. Uh, I, I'm, the, I'm in this boat. Uh, sometimes you wear out and need to fill up your resources so you can help others. Yeah, no. I mean, that's uh, my wife is always used to ask me, like, why are you playing on your phone all the time? And what it is, I'm always answering questions. I'm always answering questions while I'm sitting at dinner, while I'm doing anything else, I'm answering questions. And I will say from an educator, um, number one, your thanks and approval and, uh, and your appreciation of what we do makes a difference. When you say something nice to us about something or you say thank you for something we've done, absolutely makes us, it uh, gives us the energy to keep going. And that we sometimes need breaks and don't ask for help. And that is absolutely excellent advice. And Jeff does this also. He says there's excellent advice. Jeff is always out there sharing. So that's awesome too. Uh, so, okay, Jeremy, I have to bring this on because I have to talk about this briefly before we get out of here. Um, Say my hobby is market research, Pinterest and biz building. So yeah, you're doing your work all the time, aren't you? But been trying to get an EVA foam cosplay armor. We got to talk because what I'm going to say, folks, I have been looking for resources for better high density foams for 3D foam embroidery. And what I'm going to tell you guys is that uh, EVA foam is what puffy foam is, what 3D embroidery foam is. And so I have worked on some cool stuff with uh, using foam that is now being sold for cosplay, for which cosplay is when people dress up like, say, anime characters, comic book characters. Some of the foam that they use to make their lightweight armor is uh, pretty good embroidery foam sometimes. So I will do some experimental stuff sometimes to play with this stuff. So I will, you and me need to talk some EVA foam, Jeremy. Uh, and also, yeah, Susan brings in a great time to learn. Just bought a commercial machine being delivered next week. Can't wait. I think so. Yeah, great time. If you have the time and the resource to do it, it is time to learn. And I look forward to seeing more from you. So come in and ask questions and be here. We will teach. Oh, and Sharon says, I so appreciate answering my questions. Sharon's been just starting to in uh, digitizing, but knows uh, design. And we talked about a design with her, a cap design. And uh, once again, guys, cap designs, remember, center out, bottom up. And sometimes you have to work in regions to get outlines to line up. Sometimes you have to outline a letter as you go. It's something we talked about and something we can talk about more on this show. So with that, guys, we are a little bit of bonus time. I'm going to close out by just bringing in a couple more links and say, 
this is my limit. I have to bail out too, guys. <laughs> I'm going to know my limit and say a little over an hour is time for me to get out of the tag up and let you guys go. It was really great today. I loved having all of the comments and everybody in. Uh, first thing is uh, by popular demand. Okay, folks, by popular demand um, over at the decorators community. The, the last class that I taught was well attended. People really enjoyed it and they wanted a chance to see it, even though they couldn't be part of the live conversation. So this link here from bit.ly, bit.ly slash Eric DD, it's the same link that I had before. And yes, the capitals do matter. Um, the recording is going to be sold as well of that um, of that session. So it's just the bare recording. It's just for you to watch and see. You won't be able to interact live. You're not getting a phone call from me like the people who are on there. So it is just this bare recording. But if you go over there and check it out, uh, and I'll bring it up on screen real quick so you can see it. This is something that Aaron put together, uh, Aaron Montgomery, who runs Decorators Community and of the two regular guys, so that you could get a chance to look at that if you missed out entirely. We had a lot of people who said they missed out and couldn't attend and uh, still wanted to get that recording. Everybody who already attended the recording is there for you and you get all the extra resources. But uh, the people who just want to see the recording, um, we did decide to go ahead and make that available. Aaron told me, you know, that was something we could do. And since it was something coming up over and over, I went ahead and said, yeah, let's go ahead and do that for you folks. Because honestly, um, I'd love to get the education out there for more people, especially these are the things that I only got to teach once at a trade show. So this particular class was only ever taught once live and then goes into the mist of history after that year of trade shows. So it was cool to be able to bring that up since so many people wanted to see it. Even people who were at the show wanted to see it again. So really cool to be able to do that. Um, also, once again, I just want to make sure that you guys go over and stay strong, stitch on. I'm going to say that several times, but check out the uh, Stay Strong Stretch on post from Imbrilliance. There's lots of free designs there for you to use. There's some fun free projects if you do craft style projects as well from Lisa Shaw. But these are designs, especially some of these are, are they're commercial designs. They're designs that I created really for a commercial group. So if it's stuff that you can run for your local EMS, for your nurses, for your docs, uh, please get out there and do that stuff. I would love to see you run them. And please hashtag them, share them, at me, tag me. I will reshare. I, I want to see what you make if you make something. And I would love to get more people interested in helping out and uh, turning those idle embroidery machines into a force for good. So stay strong, stitch on. Go out and check that out at brilliance.com on the project blog. And I did have one other question. Uh, somebody asked me where I have my little stock designs. And this is what I shared uh, last week. That's the theonlystitch.com. Uh, if you want to see, it's just some random smattering of things. It's like 20 odd designs right now. I've got some others that I may put up at some point, but really that is not my focus for my time right now. Some stock designs for me that are fun and that are uh, good for learning some of the weird techniques that I talk about. So you'll find stuff on theonlystitch.com if you want to do that. Once again, what I really want to do, get over to the Imbrilliance blog, get some free designs and learn from those too. You can tear these apart because the great thing is you go over this, the, these designs for a Stay Strong Stitch On, those are native files. You'll actually be able to use the, the uh, express mode from Imbrilliance to look at the objects that I made and replay these. And then you can actually use those for some design analysis. I know we talked about design analysis. You can take those designs apart that I made. And some of them are, uh, I mean, I won't say they're all of exactly the same quality. I've had a couple that were from my earlier career that I put up there and cleaned up so we could get on top of this thing and get them out for everybody. Everybody, but they will show you my ideas on pathing and a little bit about my settings. So go tear those designs apart and learn from those ones over at in Brilliance of the Project blog. Uh, with that, folks, I think we are done. I'm going to go one more run to the comments and say um, <laughs> we have all these things going on. It looks like uh, this is awesome. A great thing about webinars is the static content can be available forever. Absolutely. And I think that's the other thing that's great. All the education we do, both in Brilliance that I do on ericcampbell.com that I've done through all the magazines. I'll say the one thing that's hard. Um, we talked about, are they going to save the magazine of posterity? Yes, they're saving the posterity at Printware, but I'm going to tell you like some of the Stitches magazines, I used to write for Stitches for years and some of that stuff is gone. And my Stitches blog, which actually I had a blog post about working at home through these difficult times that was something that was really well uh, thought of at the time and I had seen kind of brought up many times, it's kind of gone. Luckily, I have my original. I may go back and repost a new version of that for everybody. But yeah, um, it's good for that stuff to last forever, but sometimes it goes away and we, it's good for us to kind of keep putting that stuff out there. And I do love that this allows us to take that trade show stuff, which really is ephemeral, disappears after one season and bring it to y'all. So that if there is a good thing for me out of all of this is that more people have been driven to create discussion and products that really are going to be available for everybody. And some of this stuff really is evergreen. It's things that people still need to learn. I have taught how to make patches. I have taught how to do uh, small text a, a thousand times. I teach it all the time. I teach 3D foam over and over again. So having all that stuff together is really important to me. So yeah, I agree. That's great stuff. So 
what I'm going to say. Uh, yeah, and Jeremy says, can I give a link to your audience on the new trend report? Absolutely. Throw that in the comments and it will be there. If you haven't seen, uh, Jeremy Picker has got a report on uh, trends that's coming out. Really great stuff. And I appreciate him offering that for everybody and doing that trend research. He's uh, he's one of the drivers, one of the people who got me excited to discuss uh, retail looks with you guys. When I was talking about like the whip stitches and retail finishes and the different kinds of cool textures you can do, uh, Jeremy is into that pretty big and into applique. He is a guy who knows a lot about applique. So check out the stuff that he's sharing as well. But, uh, and I'll say, oh, Clay, man, thank you much. We heart Eric. Well, we heart Clay, CorelTrainer.com. If you want to learn Corel Draw, check it out. But yeah, there we are, guys. Check that out in the links in the comments. Uh, Amber, Amber Crave, uh, Jeremy Picker put this out. Fashion World of Street Style. He's got a nice uh, PDF to go check that out. So yeah, absolutely. Go check out that, that stuff. Like I said, right now, this is a time where there is so much online for you to learn from. There are so many classes and so many resources and free designs and everybody coming together. So not only do I want you to go avail yourself of it, I want you to share. I would love to see you sharing where you are because anywhere you are, you have a voice that's important to someone who is both before you, who hasn't got to the stage you're at, and someone who is beyond you that is in a stage that you are, that is past where you're at, because for those of us who have not gone to some stage, those who are early in the industry, if you're in the middle of the work, they're looking for people both that are like them so they can understand what's going on and feel camaraderie with them and understanding. They're looking for someone right in front of them because they want to know what the next steps are and what it's going to look like when they get there. They want to see somebody far in front of them so they can see what the goal looks like. The same thing happens if I am in the middle. I want to see what beginners are doing so I can see what is new and fresh that comes from that beginner's mindset where nothing is off limits. I want to see what experienced people are doing because I want to know what happens when you refine and get to the highest level. And when I'm at the highest level, I want to look down and say, what are the people doing who are at the base level? Beginner mindset again and say, what was it like when I was first coming in? What is it like now that's different from when I first came in, when it was my time to be the beginner? What are people working on in the middle of their career where they're having sticking points? And I want to, where can I help them? And what is different about that than it was for me? And then at the end, I want to say, what's the place where I can leave a legacy and share with everybody who's coming up? So any stage you're at, you have something to share. And this is a great time, especially when you have dead time to share. So everybody uh, get inspired, do the thing, get on those machines, do your work. And like I have been saying over and over, stay strong, stitch on, and keep it together, folks. Take care of yourselves.